Welcome to Hibbert Health. Today, Dr. DeMello is joining me to share further discussions about managing COVID-19. Dr. DeMello is a family medicine practitioner in Mumbai, India, and he has treated over 3,000 patients challenged with COVID-19. In our recent discussions, Dr. DeMello shared treatment recommendations for early COVID exposure and symptoms. Today, he's gonna to talk with us about those patients that reach out to him after a week or so of symptoms. Dr. DeMello, can you please review the treatment protocols you recommended for early exposure and symptoms of COVID-19 and then take us to this very concerning stage of COVID-19? Thank you, Jennifer. I'm happy to review my treatment protocol and my treatment plan for these patients who come to me in week one and week two. There are two, two parts to this disease. In week one, when they come to me, they straight away get a, a three drug regimen an anti-inflammatory, which is colchicin, an antiviral drug, ivermectin, that will reduce the viral load, or in layman terms, it says kill the virus, and clopidogrel, which is an anti-clotting drug to prevent clotting. So these three drugs work in tandem. They work together. And because, you know the, the anti-inflammatory is probably the most important because it reduces the inflammation in the body to that virus, to the virus, and then you could the ivermectin, with the course I give it, I give it for the, the patient will have no virus at the end of 48 hours from the time we give the we give the ivermectin. The anti-clotting drug is always in play because you need to stop the clotting just in case the, the dates that they, the patient has given us. You know, some patients will say, "Okay, I got." I got a cold, I got this on this date, and I may calculate that as being day one. In reality, he may have had body, body pain or some other symptom two days before, three days before, that actually turns out to be the start of the whole symptoms. When we get to the second week, it's the same three drug regimen, and then a more acute watch is kept on their oximeter reading. Their oximeter reading is very important. That's the only hard data point that I work with Anything below 95, I start taking more action. Daryl, is there any activity you might suggest to increase oxygenation of the blood? A six minute walk before you do the uh, oximeter reading or do proning. Proning has helped patients a lot. Really, if they do it aggressively, it helps them avoid that clotting uh, in the early stages. Daryl, can you please explain what proning is? Proning is, a, is an exercise that one does going on one's uh, uh, hands and legs uh, and breathing, doing breathing exercises where your, your, your front is actually towards the ground and your back is, your back is up because you want the back of the lungs or your posterior part of your body to actually be up so that that blood that's, that's in the back portion is moved around and it doesn't stay stagnant and clot up. Let me clarify what proning is. It's, it's being on your elbows and on your knees with your front of your body facing the floor and the back of your body facing the ceiling with your face in your hands, correct? And correct. Okay. correct. And how long do you suggest patients stay like that or how frequently do you suggest they do that? And please explain what activity you want them to do, how you would like them to breathe, what you suggest that is most helpful. Okay. Proning is an exercise where a patient person goes down on the knees and the elbows and the hands are put under, their face is put on the, in the hands. And it, the front of your body will actually be towards the ground and the back of your body will be up towards the ceiling or the sky, okay? While they are in that position, the patient is asked to actually breathe in and out pretty aggressively and try and cough. This helps the blood that's in the back of the lungs and the, in, you know, the lower part of the lungs to actually move around and stop clotting. The, the second step is, is also asking them to do it more aggressively. That means coughing it out. If they can cough, even mild coughing, it's easier because it makes the, the blood move, move around in the lungs. The, the other thing about proning is it needs to be done three or four times a day in, in somebody who's in that 
in that 90 to 95 range where they've just started clotting, I always tell them, even if you do it 10 times a day, do it. Whether you do it for three minutes or five minutes each time, it doesn't matter. Many people talk about doing it for 30 and 45 minutes. More, many patients who are really ill, very, very weak with COVID, with the COVID inflammation, they can't do 45 minutes. I'd rather have them do even for five minutes at a time or three minutes at a time, but multiple times. One example, one classic example I can share with you is a patient who I was called, I was told that he had a oximeter reading of 60 at 6 a.m. in the morning. And my first, my first answer to, him, to them was, get him admitted. They said, there's no beds. What can you help us with? I said, do proning. And I explained to them what proning was. And they wanted me to come and visit them at home and sort of help treat them there. But I told them to do aggressive proning, which they did. Because when I showed up at their house an hour and a half later, the oximeter reading was now at 80. Okay, so proning does help in the acute phase. Second thing is, of course, with this patient, I end up using Lovenox and treating him and kind of going forward with that, brought him back to 90. Uh, within, within the same day, from 6 a.m. to, to 10.30 at night, he had gone from 60 to 96. And this is something that if you treat time in time, I call this timeliness of treatment, if you can treat these patients, they need not have that clotting. And this patient is a classic example of such a, such a uh, objective that one should have. That's amazing. Your information about proning is such practical, important information. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think a lot of people are going to take this to heart and practice that. It just makes so much sense. Really, it's really, I'm impressed. I've never heard about proning before. So, yeah, thank you. I've been talking about, you know, first stage or first week. I, I sort of divide the first week into day one to four where the patient is early and you can really get them to do certain things and get them really treated. The earlier you come for treatment as a patient, the better chance you have to, to not only survive this, but recover from this disease within the 14 days. So the earlier a patient comes to a doctor and the earlier the doctor treats the patient, this patient will recover pretty well. We cannot have these patients go home and we cannot tell this patient to go home and take their vitamins and wait till you collapse and till, till you cannot breathe, then you come to hospital. That is not the approach we take. The approach we take is proactive, give them the, the three drug regimen, colchicin, ivermectin, and clopidogrel, so that when they, they come to that end of the first week, they're not so, um, so much at risk to start clotting because we've already started blocking it early. We've started reducing the inflammation early. We've started treating, we've killed the virus. We've reduced the viral, viral load really early. And now it's not about dealing with the virus, it's about dealing with the inflammation in the body. So consciousness is then continued for the whole 30 days at a particular dosage. That's really great information. Thank you very much for sharing that. Now let's step into the second week because the progression changes as we go on and people's symptoms get worse. Can you please walk us there? As, as I said earlier, COVID is a disease that's divided into two weeks, week one and week two. If a patient comes in week one, they have a better chance of getting treated immediately. And the chance of them progressing to clotting in week two is, is reduced almost to zero. If they come to me, late week one or early week two, the chance of them having problems is very, very high. The, the data point that I depend upon is the oximeter reading. The oximeter reading is very important, especially when they come to me day seven, eight or nine, because I normally would expect them to start falling. So the, the oxygen saturation, I would expect it to start falling from 95 to 100, to maybe in 1992, or maybe even down to 85. My cutoff point for treating people at home using telemedicine or inpatient, in-person uh, treatment at home is 85. If they get to 85, they are going to be advised to go to a hospital to get admitted. So that 85, they need oxygen, which we cannot provide in a home healthcare scenario. So for me, 
if somebody comes to me on day eight in the second week, it's very important that I start consider the risk factors that they make they get into. If their oximeter reading is between 90 and 95, I will lead with an oxyparin, a low molecular weight heparin, which in the Western world is called uh, Lovenox, is a brand name. We have we have Flexin and a bunch of other brand names here, but I would lead with that. Uh, and then, of course, at the same time, I'd give them uh, Colchicin, Ivermectin if it's day seven, eight, or nine, and Clopidogrel to, to kind of a tide over the balance of it. If I'm giving them anoxyparin, I will not start with Clopidogrel. When I'm done with anoxyparin, then I'll put them back on Clopidogrel. So that's some of the strategies in the early part of the second week. In the later part of the second week, if somebody has survived till day 10 without any challenges, without any breathlessness, without his oximeter reading, his or her oximeter reading going down, more or less at day 10, I won't say they're out of danger, but more or less than 80, 90% out of danger. So then it's about treating them with colchicin and clopidogrel. And what about giving ivermectin in the latter stage of the second week? Can you talk about that, whether you would give ivermectin or not at that point? Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the question. I will give ivermectin up to day eight. After day eight, maybe day ninth, I will give ivermectin. After that, I stay away from ivermectin. The reason I would not give ivermectin in the second part of the second week is because we've been given to understand that the virus does not survive in the body beyond day eight. So the body naturally will kill the virus. And, I, you know, I've not seen my patients have, if they had persistent virus in the second part of the second week, they will still have aggressive uh, inflammation. So if I start them on, on anti-inflammatory drugs uh, and anti-clotting drugs without using ivermectin, it wouldn't work if, I, if the virus was still present. So I'm not seeing the, the effects of a virus after day nine or 10. So day nine or 10 onwards, my belief is, and my, my practice, I'm giving you observation from practice. I'm not, I'm not uh, talking from a textbook here. I'm talking from practice. I'm seeing that the, the inflammation is the most important thing one has to focus on. If you can reduce that inflammation and support the anti-clotting uh, angle of it, this patient should recover pretty nicely over the next two, three weeks. So this is good news that patients improve dramatically over the next three weeks. And when is the turning point beyond that? I, I work on the you know the 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then six months when I'm treating patients. And every all these dates are related to date of onset of the first symptoms. So that is day one. So it's it's always good to calculate what is day one, and then you can you can sort of map out your whole uh, treatment plan for week one, week two, uh, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then six months. So 180 days. Uh, for me in particular, my aggressive treatment really goes 30 days first. Based on the status of the patient on day 30th, which I may even ask for a CT scan of the chest, I may ask for labs, various kind of markers, biomarkers that I want to see. And based on that, then I decide, do I want to go another month or put them on the sec second stage of the down, you step down uh, treatment to for the next 60 days. So I do one month, I do two, two months, two and three months become two months, uh, 60 days, so it's 90 days there. And then I do the whole, uh, the whole uh, thing of six months after that. Many patients are, are really better on day 30th, but then you can step them down for the next 60 days. So by day 90th, I can tell them, you're more or less fully recovered from COVID. You don't need to take any more medicines, okay? If they are not fully recovered and at, at 90 days, then I will suggest to take Colchicin one tablet a day for the next you know, 90 days again, so that at six months, they have recovered fully. And these patients are patients mainly who have had very bad uh, uh, severity scores on the, on the um, CT scan, had clotting in the lung, or they've had brain issues, had major headaches, uh, you know, we can even do an MRI of the brain to see what the ischemic levels are. 
any any foci of ischemia in the brain, and I've seen that. Uh, so again, it all depends on what the status of the patient is on day 30th, day 60th, day 90th, and day 180. My, in my in my practice, in my observations are that if they have recovered in the first 180 days, they will not have they will not have long term problems. Okay, so treating these patients with colchicin even up to 180 days, six months, can help prevent what in layman terms is called long haul COVID. Okay, so getting aggressive right up front in the first 14 days getting aggressive in the next you know, 15 days till you get to day 30 yet. And then, you know, treating, treating them with anti-inflammatory colchicin for, for 90 days will prevent, prevent the patient from going into long haul COVID. That's my, my experience I've had. And I, you know, I haven't had too many patients go out all to six months. It's a very small fraction of the total number of patients I've done. Now, I understand you're seeing patients internationally, and are you seeing varied symptoms coming from different countries? Because uh, we know there's a lot of different mutations of the virus out there. Uh, what are you seeing in general? Last year, many countries would tell a patient, oh, you're asymptomatic, oh, you're mildly symptomatic, you're moderately symptomatic. Please go home, take your vitamins. If you have a breathing problem and you cannot think, then come to and see us. That's not the approach we should take with these patients. We cannot tell them to go home and stay at home and do nothing. Please give them treatment to reduce the inflammation, to first to kill the virus, to reduce inflammation, and then to block the clotting. If you do that, you won't have these patients come to you with long-term problems. Interesting. Um, and maybe you can give some guidance here is because in most of the Western countries, because in India, Early treatment is supported by doctors and by the hospitals, correct? Yes. Uh, so that's wonderful that in India, early treatment and interventive care is very supported. However, in the Western countries, early treatment is not being addressed because COVID is being treated as if most people will get over this and then you'll be fine. So go home and handle it and just come to the hospital if you can't breathe. And if your oxygen sat goes down below 90. So can, do you have some advice to help gently move medical, medical opinion about this condition where early treatment does make a big difference? And even if a person can combat COVID, if they don't get some supportive care medically, they're gonna end up with long haul symptoms for the most part. Am I right in saying that? You're right, Jennifer. And uh, the, the uh, suggestion I can make to the medical community is please treat these patients early. If you treat them early, the damage to the brain, the damage to the organs will not happen or will happen in a much less manner that they eventually will not become long haul COVID. My, in my practice in particular, I do not have a patient today who's, who has any symptoms beyond six months. I do have some between three and six months, and but at six months, they're fully treated. Beyond six months, today I'm seeing patients internationally who, who are coming to me for treatment or for suggestions for treatment for their problems, month six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Uh, I'm happy to talk to doctors. I'm happy to share the information I, in the experience I've had the treatment I use, but I really want people to start trying to treat these patients. One is early in the process, two is even when they come in the post COVID phase, that to treat them appropriately with anti-inflammatory. In the younger population, are you finding that people are recovering with no long haul symptoms? Uh, children usually don't get affected. The percentage of children that get affected up is very, very, very low. And I'm saying this, uh, talking about families, when I treat family members, you know, and patients, I think in my 3000 plus patients, I have a, a fraction of children who are small. Uh, many of the children who I see are the asymptomatics or mildly symptomatics amongst the family members. It's all about recognizing that COVID uh, as a disease. If you can recognize it, I've had people tell me, you know, other doctors say that this is a, a, an allergy. 
that this is fungal infection. This is, it's not fungal infection. It's not an allergy. It looks like an allergy because you get those red hives on the hands and legs or parts of the, the torso. It's COVID. So anybody who has, uh, you know, I get plenty of things. Oh, I've just got body ache. Oh, I've just got a mild headache. Uh, I'm feeling feverish, but I don't have fever. That's a common symptom I get. I'm feeling feverish. My body is feeling hot. It's not normal to me. I, I'm feeling very odd, but I don't have fever. That's COVID. So these are all the, the, I'm giving you literally what patients tell me. And I'm giving my response to them and say, this is COVID. You're going to start treatment here. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this, this, this. Give them a protocol to follow at home. And tell them, you will do your COVID test, RT-PCR test on day four, five, and six. I literally give them the date I want them to do it. And I may even you know, get an appointment for them to, to do it. I give them who, whom to, to talk to in their city, what to do, what date to ask for, so that it can be planned in advance. So these are things we can do as doctors is not to ignore these guys. Somebody coming to you with a symptom that's out of the normal, the classical one is this thing of uh, people come to me with, you know, doc, I'm feeling very uneasy. I'm not feeling right. I don't have fever. My pulse rate is fine. Everything is fine, but I'm feeling very uneasy. Uh, I'm feeling feverish, but I'm not, I don't have fever. So these are little tips you can, if you listen to this patient, and follow up, they will have COVID, you know? So treatment is absolutely necessary in these patients. Do not wait for it, say, no, we'll give them uh, vitamins or we'll do steam inhalation or we'll do this and that without giving them the medicine. I give them day one, if they come to me with all these symptoms, I give them day one, start them on treatment. It makes a huge difference to the, the long-term effect of COVID. Daryl, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise. You present your information in such a medically practical manner. And I do look forward to having further discussions with you about long haul cases, because I know you have many coming to you from all over the world. Thank you again.